Um, we're getting a lot of questions about that concept of asynchronous versus synchronous learning. I think you saw it in some of the Zoom chats last week. Um, and a lot of parents are asking the question of, about why can't my kid's teacher just provide you know, live video daily or on a regular basis where it looks like an in-person lesson? Um, what would you say to a parent who's asking that question about their teacher providing live video? Sure. So, you know, as you, as many people have heard right now, we are in a remote learning situation and in some people call it, would even call it an emergency remote learning situation where we are all um, on a pretty steep learning curve. The, the parents, the, the students and, and our teachers, our teachers are not uh, credentialed um, to teach online instruction. That was not what they went to university for, for the most part. And so We've been learning as we go, and we've been really intentional about making sure that, um, you know, as we started this, this remote learning experience, that we weren't doing things. We were trying to minimize the amount of new platforms that, that students needed to learn with, you know, with only online teacher guidance to assist them with. And, and as well with our teachers, we wanted to begin with a focus on the types of um, digital platforms and digital resources that they were familiar with so that they could focus on the content and focus on the student. Um, the other thing about asynchronous versus synchronous is that we wanted to ensure that we gave the maximum amount of access to, to the lessons and to the teachers teaching um, by using recordings. That's the asynchronous piece. It's recorded lessons that students could access um, when it was convenient and when they were able to do so, not only at a specific time. And there are many factors that would, um, you know, inhibit a student from being able to uh, log on at, at 8 a.m. every single day, whether you're looking at bandwidth, whether you're looking at three, you know, multiple siblings in the home and parents working, um, device, how many devices are in the home, bandwidth. Um, I think all of us have had situations where things are freezing up and many families, I know my family, we've, you know, called up our cable uh, company and, and, and had to purchase increased, you know, a, a more premium package and not all, all of our families can just, you know, have the luxury of picking up the phone and doing things like that, especially if there is a, an unemployment situation. Um, or, you know, the other thing is we have, we have healthcare workers, we have first responders as families and, um, we have received a lot of feedback from families that, you know, my, my teenage son or daughter is watching their siblings, in some cases toddlers and infants during the day because, as you know, the preschools and daycares are closed so that their mothers and fathers can go out and I'm just going to say, hey, save the world, and we need to be receptive of that. Now, moving forward, many of our teachers have started to um, experiment with, with different Zoom uh, meetings for fam for kids and you know scheduled at different times and and then they're recorded so that we can have kind of both synchronous and asynchronous opportunities and I think those are going very well. Uh, Dr. Vince there's a survey going out right now it's continuing on what is the um, the kind of feedback that is being asked for um, and how do you think the teaching and learning team and um, will be able to collect that feedback um, share it with schools and, and make improvements? So first I would just say I am, you know, that feedback is so important to us. So I appreciate the people who are taking the time to complete the surveys and get that information to us. We will be sharing it out with the board of trustees. We'll be sharing it out with our schools. Um, in, the, in the short run, in the short term, we'll be looking um, for some information about participation rates. We'll be looking for some information about challenges families are facing so that we can address some of those things right now uh, during phase two of our learning plan. Um, overall, while we'd be looking at making tweaks to phase two based on some of the feedback, phase two was built um, with new learning in mind uh, to be durable and to, um, to last through May 29th through the end of the school year. And during that time, We'll be using survey data and other information that we're gathering along with guidance from TEA and the state and um, Governor Abbott to um, develop phase three, which would be what does school look like in August as we all return 
um, for the fall. So Kimberly, we've had a lot of questions from parents about special programs. Um, what do services, what should services look like for students receiving 504 dyslexia and special education services? And where can parents go if they have questions? Sure, absolutely. Um, services are looking different based on every individual student. Um, just as a reminder, we created lesson plans each week um, based on individual student needs and individual student goals, accommodations, um, and you know, modifications written in their plan. Um, and so those are both synchronous and asynchronous. You know, we have um, some speech therapy lessons um, that are being used through Seesaw. So lessons are being recorded or skills are being recorded and students are responding so that our speech pathologists can um, look at the student progress. Um, we've got social skills, lunch bunches happening. Um, our students in dyslexia are recording and practicing their air charts. Um, so it, it just depends on the student's individual needs and our student our, our staff has worked really hard to make sure that, that each student's needs are met. Um, so it looks a variety of different ways. Um, they are posting activities through Google Classroom and secondary. Um, there are some live Zooms on some cases. And so there's a lot of great activities going on. I'm super proud of the work from our teachers, our tracking teachers, our coordinators. If you have questions, we always encourage you to reach out to the tracking teacher or um, their coordinator, the 504 coordinator. Um, we are taking feedback from our families. Um, that's how we know what's working best. Um, so continue to provide that feedback. Seek out if you have questions. Um, our staff is here to help. So the 2021 budget year is the second year of the biennium. So state aid is not going to change. The only unknowns for the upcoming budget year are, will the student growth materialize as projected and will homeowners be able to pay their property taxes? So those are the two unknowns. But as far as expenditures, it is a very um, typical budget because your, your expenditures are based on your revenue. So we are projecting with what we do know a $13 million decline in revenues over our original projections in January. But the expenditures don't really change. So we know we have a certain amount of revenues to support the expenditures and whether we use those expenditures to buy material goods like books and paper and supplies, or we use those dollars to support online instruction, the, the budget itself doesn't really change. Well, there's definitely a strong fund balance, and that is evident through looking at history. Four out of the five last years, there's been an increase to fund balance. That's going to help offset the deficit that we're projecting for the 2021 school year and help us plan when we know more about what student growth looks like and what funding looks like in the years following 2021. Now what would happen in years past this biennium in the next legislative session would be results of any substantial funding cuts and then we would have to react to those cuts and, and trail our belt, so to speak, and be able to operate and provide educational services with the funds that are available. This isn't like a hurricane event or a loss in oil values that only affects a couple of districts. This is a statewide and a nationwide impact. And so we're all in it together and we're all strategizing together and trying to determine what will happen, and that's the unknown, not knowing what will actually happen from this. People who are currently with us, you know, we are moving forward with growth positions for next year. We're opening Danielson. We're moving forward with hiring for Danielson. Um, as we get into the summer and the fall, um, we will know more about the following year um, as to what that is gonna look like and what our potential budget impacts will be. But for next year, we're gonna move forward with hiring as we um, had intended and expecting the growth. And if we need to adjust in the summer, later in the summer, where we're seeing we're not getting that growth, we can adjust using attrition uh, and positions that have still not been hired for at that point. So we presented a 2% across the board um, option for the board to consider. 
during the discussion, knowing that we have potentially hard budget times ahead, we are looking at some other options like a one-time payment based on some revenue parameters. So if we meet revenue expectations, if we get that growth, we would um, have a one-time payment possibly in the fall to supplement employees. Um, I think given so many unknowns, we're trying to offer the board some options that would give them more flexibility. Uh, knowing that if we, the more we tie the, the district to a across the board increase, that could position us to have to reduce even more positions the following year. So if we have some flexibility in offering maybe a one-time payment, as opposed to an across the board raise, uh, we could see maybe not having to eliminate as many positions moving forward. I know there's been a lot of people who are wondering what they do with their device, their MLISD device, or even their elementary school device that they borrowed. Um, what is the plan for MLISD devices that students have going into the summer and into next year? So Corey, what our plan is, is that students with these, um, any of the devices, whether it's the secondary MLISD devices or the Chromebooks that we have um, loaned out to elementary students, we're going to uh, let students keep these devices over the summer um, rather than try to collect them right now. We know that um, safety is number one. It's our top priority. And so we want to make sure that um, students have these devices and they're going to keep them over the summer. And then we will work out a collection time once it's safe for us uh, to be able to return in the fall. Um, all of this information is going to be sent out in Friday's update. So parents of both secondary students and elementary students, if you'll just uh, read through all of the details in Friday's update and just let us know if you have any additional questions.